Good morning, Hope City. My name is Samuel Vu, and I'll be giving the message today. Just to introduce myself a little, my family has been attending Hope City now for about a year and a half. And here is a slide, a picture of them. A uh, recent picture, you know, one of our excursions going camping this past uh, summer. My wife, Grace, my children, Joshua, Rachel, and Daniel. Joshua in the front there, Rachel just behind her. Grace, of course, my lovely wife in the middle. Uh, Daniel behind her, and I'm at the back. Before coming to Hope City, I was previously pastoring at a church in Vancouver, and I stepped down from that position a few years ago, and I'm currently a student again. I'm studying at the University of Wales. And it's a funny story I'll share with you. Uh, when I first shared this with my family over dinner, uh, I could see that my daughter was visibly upset. And I said, Rachel, what's wrong? Why are you upset? And she looked at me, and she was almost about to cry, and she said, Daddy, that's not fair. I want to study Wales too. How come you get to study Wales? I love Wales. Of course, I don't study Wales at the University of Wales, but I study at the University of the Country of Wales. I'm currently studying theology and biblical studies, and I'm in the third year of my program there. Probably a disappointment to my daughter who loves animals. Now, today we're continuing in the series in Habakkuk, which Jason kicked off last week, and Pastor Andrew uh, will wrap up next week. I'm responsible for the central section of Habakkuk, um, this uh, big chunk in the middle, and that's what we're going to be uh, talking about today. As a word of introduction to the prophet Habakkuk, as I was meditating on what to focus on, the first thing that stood out to me really was this emphasis on God speaking to us, this prophetic word which God gives to his people through the prophets. And I think it's a very relevant message, a re relevant word for us, this point, but also a very challenging one because our culture and Habakkuk's culture are vastly different in this respect. Habakkuk, you see, lived in a time in which his society understood God and human activity in the world to be very intertwined and integrated together. So it would not be out of the ordinary for spiritual things and physical things and historical things all to be intertwined together. The Israelites, as well as the other cultures and peoples around them, assumed that God and the spiritual was simply part of their reality and assumed that God could and would communicate with them. Right? It's not just an assumption of the Israelites, but also the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, and then after them, the Romans and the Greeks as well. The difference between the Israelites and all the other cultures around them lay not so much in whether God or the gods spoke to them, but in what God was speaking to them and how God was speaking to them. And today, our society, of course, is very different. We live in a post-scientific post-enlightenment era in which the supernatural and the natural are just so far removed from each other. And one of the things that we wrestle with genuinely, which the ancient world did not, is does God really speak with us? Is God really still engaging with us in the same way that the ancients thought they did, that God did in the past? Now that is not, um, that is not a problem that the ancient world had. The secular assumption is that God either is not present or that he doesn't exist or that he's so far removed that he just makes no practical difference for us. In, in, in our world, it takes a great leap of imagination for the secular mind just to consider that there's any kind of real ability or possibility for supernatural to communicate with the natural. That's why I think the, the movie Interstellar was so uh, brilliant. In that movie, the main character, Cooper, is a scientist from Earth and he's sent into outer space because the Earth has been undergoing this global warming and environmental catastrophe after catastrophe. And his mission is to explore other inhabitable worlds in the galaxy. But as the story unfolds, Cooper finds himself pulled into this black hole and in, into this tesseract. And the tesseract is this construction in space which transcends space and time. And it's in that tesseract that he finds that he's able to communicate with his daughter from years and years and years ago, somehow, over space and over time. But part of what that movie reveals to me is that despite our society's secular and naturalistic assumptions about life on this planet, we are still longing for real communication from something or someone beyond us. And that is, of course, what the Bible tells us that God does especially in the prophets. God does speak to us. He does want to engage with us in this world. He has broken into this world and has spoken to us and continues to speak to us. So that's what uh, I want to begin with, just to uh, open us up and in that kind of a posture, how do we come to him? 
we perhaps need to suspend our modern disbelief that God can truly speak to us, that the supernatural can indeed uh, penetrate and break into this natural world that we are living in. And just to try to suspend our modern disbelief and try to come to him as best as we can with open hearts, with open ears, listening to what he may want to say to us. Now to the book of Habakkuk. The book of Habakkuk can be outlined in three main parts, as you see here in this slide. In the first part, verses 1 to 11, the first chapter, which Jason covered last week, uh, the prophet Habakkuk speaks his lament, his complaint to Yahweh, and then Yahweh responds. In the second part, which is what we're covering today, uh, verses one to, uh, chapter 1, verse 12 to 2, verse 20, the prophet Habakkuk responds to Yahweh's response with a second complaint. And in that second section, Yahweh again responds a second time to the prophet Habakkuk. And this time it's a lengthy response from 2.1 all the way to 2.20. And in the third part, which Pastor Andrew will cover next week, the prophet Habakkuk offers a prayer in response to Yahweh that is written as a song of praise. So I hope that diagram just clarifies with you where we are in our text in the book of Habakkuk today. In this next slide, I simply expand that middle section and uh, what we're looking at today. And that middle section itself can be separated or outlined in three subsections. And that's the order that we're going to cover them here today. I'll just briefly talk about them, uh, name them out for you. The first section is from 1, uh, 12 to 2, 1, in which the prophet Habakkuk speaks his second complaint, his second lament to God. And the second subject section is from 2, verse 2 to 2, verse 5, in which Yahweh responds to the prophet Habakkuk. And then the final and third section from 2, verse 6 or 2, verse 20 is uh, the, the part in which the prophet Habakkuk extends that vision and comments and commentaries, uh, commentates on that vision from God. So we're going to cover each of those sections, but focusing especially on that middle section, part 2, the Lord's second answer to Habakkuk. I believe that's a climax of our text and where we'll spend most of our time today. So slide, the next slide. Uh, 112 to 21. We'll cover that first. Remember that just before this section is Habakkuk 1 1 to 111, which Jason covered for us uh, last week. And in that section, Habakkuk looks around at his fellow countrymen in his home country of Judah and he asks God, How long is all this wickedness going to go on for? He sees as if the law, the Torah, is paralyzed and justice never goes forth, he says in 1 verse 4. And then God responds, he's doing a new thing. He's raising up the Babylonians or the Chaldeans as an answer to that wickedness of Judah. Now I'm going to read out a few representative verses from this first subsection of the second section to you. Verse 12, the the prophet Habakkuk continues, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them the Babylonians, as a judgment. And you, O rock, have established them for reproof. You who are pure eyes and to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the one, the man, more righteous than he? And then the prophet continues to describe just how merciless and even more wicked the Babylonians are than his fellow countrymen, the Judeans. And then he ends his speech with chapter 2, verse 1. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he, the Lord, will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. As Jason pointed out last week, God sometimes answers us in unexpected and astonishing ways. And for Habakkuk, that was that God was raising the Chaldeans or the Babylonians to come and judge Israel. And Habakkuk responds to Yahweh's response now. His first complaint was about the wickedness of Israel, his own people. His second complaint is a protest that God's solution is even worse than the initial problem. Yes, Israel is wicked and Israel is committing sin, but Babylon is far more evil than Israel. Surely Israel is more righteous than Babylon. The first thing I want to point out from these verses is this dialogue, this back and forth that uh, that Habakkuk is having with God. The Bible describes Habakkuk's interaction with God not as one conversation, but as two There's a speech, there's a response, a speech and a response. And I think this is a good example of how we might approach God in times of trouble. In prayer, but not any any kind of prayer, sometimes we think that prayer is just all about talking, us talking words to God and God receiving our prayers. But the picture here in Habakkuk is that conversation with God is not just a monologue. In fact, it's not just a dialogue in which there's back and forth, But it's more than a dialogue. It's a conversation where there's back and forth and back and forth. 
And I think what that speaks to is the continuing relationship that the prophet had with Yahweh, with the Lord, with the living God. I think that's the first point we can glean from this uh, passage, is that prayer in times of trouble ought to be a dialogue, a conversation with God. Secondly, notice how uh, notice Habakkuk's location as he ends his speech in 2 verse 1. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he, the Lord, will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Notice he says he will take his stand on the watchtower at his watch post. Now this watchtower or this watch post was a place where the prophets would go in the ancient world to hear from the Lord. They would go up to this tower until they saw some revision. They received some vision or, or heard some oracle from Yahweh, from the living God, literally not leaving this tower until God answered them. A couple weeks ago, my family visited Vancouver Island. And one of the sites that we visited was the National Historic Site, uh, Fisgard Lighthouse is the picture on the slide that, that we took there. And we actually took that picture. It looks like a postcard or it looks like a poster, but actually we took it. And that's a real picture that we have taken. Now that lighthouse was a first lighthouse in Western Canada. And so it has long and rich history. I learned lots about lighthouses as a consequence. Before the era of GPS and satellite imagery, lighthouses played a crucial role. And they signaled to ships that land was near and that they were about to approach the coast and they helped ships to navigate and not be shipwrecked on the, the rocks of the coast. There are two qualities of lighthouses especially that are vital to a lighthouse. The first is its location. Usually it's located at the furthest tip of land that juts out into the ocean so it signals to ships, incoming ships, that land is near, the ocean is becoming shallower, so it helps guide ships and prevents shipwrecks. For example, this uh, Fisgard Lighthouse is built right at the mouth of the Esquimalt Harbor. That was a busy, busy harbor in the earlier uh, settlement of Canada. Furthermore, in terms of location, lighthouses are built high up from the ground so that it might be as visible from as far away as possible. And being high up near means that ships can see it from as far away as possible and nothing will obstruct its light. And the second quality, perhaps even more important than the first, which is its location, the second quality is that that light is perpetually lit. Back in the day before electrification, lighthouse keepers, as they were known, would have to, be, would have to take four-hour shifts throughout the day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Often there would only be one family or one lighthouse keeper in this, uh, lighthouse, uh, in this lighthouse. And they would have to keep this lighthouse lit seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, maintaining the fuel for that flame, maintaining the lenses of that lighthouse to make sure that the light was emitting properly to its surroundings so that those who were coming in, especially in turbulent weather, especially at night in darker conditions, that they wouldn't be let down that they wouldn't wreck their own ships and their merchandise and their lives on the rocks and potentially die. I think this is similar to the attitude, the posture of the prophet in the watchtower. The prophet goes into this watchtower away from the noise, away from the busyness, away from the center of the busyness of the city and waits in vigilance, constant vigilance and patience, listening for and looking out for God's message to his people. In some ways, I think that's similar in how we can approach God, especially in times of trouble. Often it's away from the noise, away from the center of things, away from the busyness of our lives that we're able to hear God and receive from God. And usually God doesn't speak according to our own timelines. He's not a genie in a bottle at our beck and call. We have to wait for him in vigilance and in patience, like a lighthouse keeper, keeping that light on, because we don't know when God will speak to us. We don't know exactly what he wants to say to us. And so we just are patient and wait. Those are the key words, patience and vigilance. And this theme will even continue and even intensify in this next section. So now we move to this next section of our text, the climax, I believe, of the text, the actual vision that Habakkuk receives, Yahweh's second response to Habakkuk's second complaint. I'm going to read out verses 2 to 3 for us. And the Lord answered me, write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Let me repeat. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. 
it will not delay. Even before, before God reveals what the content of his vision is in verse 4, he tells Habakkuk of the timing of this vision. He says that it has an appointed time. In other words, it may seem like it's taking a long time in our human understanding, in our human reckoning. It may seem like God is delaying and delaying and that there is no purpose in this waiting. And he's putting things off indefinitely. But that is not the case. It will come. God is assuring Habakkuk. It may be slow according to your understanding and my understanding, but it will come. There is no doubt about it. God is giving us his assurance as sure as we can know. He gives us his own word. It will not lie. It will not deceive. It will come. And so God tells Habakkuk in that watchtower, wait for it. Wait for it. None of us, I think, likes to wait. I know I don't. I, I like things to be efficient. If I can take a shortcut and shave 30 seconds off of my commute, uh, I'll do it. If I have to move over to the next line at the grocery store because that one seems like it's going faster, I'll do it. I have no shame about that. If I'm watching TV and a commercial comes on and I can change the channel and save three and a half minutes and watch something else, I'll do it. None of us, I think, likes to wait. It doesn't come naturally to us. But this attitude does not transfer well to our spiritual lives. Often when we bring some deep need to God, some trial, some question, some circumstance that we're wrestling with in our lives, that we're crying out to him about, we're waiting for his response, often his response is to wait. Perhaps his response to is, is, it's not yet time. It's not yet time for you to speak. It's not yet time for you to act. It's not yet your time to be freed from the circumstances from which you want to be freed from. It'll happen, God assures us, but not yet and not right now. Now think about the context of Habakkuk for a second. From the best of our knowledge, the prophet Habakkuk received this vision just before the exile. In other words, the exile hadn't happened. We know that because there is no mention of the exile in this book at all. But the Babylonians are there, and they're, they're about to invade. In other words, God would not answer the second complaint of Habakkuk's any time in the near future. Things would get much worse, in fact, before they got any better. Not only had the exile not happened yet, but once they were in exile, we know that in history it would be another 70 years after that exile happened, that before the exile was over, before Babylon finally was overthrown by Persia and the King Cyrus would allow the Israelites to return home. In other words, Habakkuk probably never saw the fruition of God's promise. It must have seemed to him that it just was not meant to be. It must have seemed to his contemporaries as well that just God was not not moving. Of course, we have the privilege of hindsight now. In history, we see that indeed Babylon was judged, and God did accomplish his purpose at the right time in history and in his own way, but the prophet had to wait, perhaps his entire life in that mode of expectation. God's timing is not our timing. Now, I remember when I first accepted the church's call for me to be the English pastor of New Life Chinese Lutheran Church, I did not take up that call very easily. You could say that I was a bit like Jonah. I tried to run in the other direction. The church was here in Vancouver, and I, I went to Hong Kong to consider my options and think about what my options were. Uh, I, I even interviewed with a church there in Hong Kong, but I had no peace about it. I felt that God was asking me to come back to Vancouver and to continue my discernment process. I remember very distinctly the turning point in that process. I was in Vancouver, I was meeting with some of the leaders of the church, expressing my concerns, my worries, anxieties. There had not been an English pastor in that church for several years, I said. Uh, I grew up in this church, and so it would be hard for people to change their perspective of me to be a pastor here. I'd be working by myself, there would be no support, I said. And there were two English ministry leaders that I was meeting with, who both of whom uh, I'd grown up with in Sunday school and in youth group, and I looked up to. And one of them looked me in the eye and he said to me, he said, Sam, you have my full support. If nobody supports you, I will support you. You have my full support, Sam. And he said it with such conviction, I took it as a promise from God, and that changed my heart. I accepted the position, and that's what led me to receiving that call, accepting that call, that new life. Well, fast forward six years later, I was now on the edge of burnout. Those two leaders were nowhere to be seen in the church. I was caught in the middle of these big controversies in the church and the crossfire of church politics between the Mandarin ministry and the Cantonese ministry. And I even was personally attacked for some things that had nothing to do with me. Spiritually, I felt like I was a hypocrite, not living the way that uh, I was preaching. 
we just had our first child and I was exhausted. I was tired. My marriage felt like it was falling apart. And my life just felt like it was falling apart. I ended up taking a stress leave just to survive. But it was in that season, in those months as I was in the spiritual desert, that that leader who had originally met with me in that interview and promised me that he would be there, he called me up and he took me out for a drink and then he apologized for not being there, what he had said, what he promised seven years ago. See, he had gone through his own spiritual trials. I took him out of the church for a time. He apologized just for not being there when I needed him. And that really touched me. Again, it was I took it as if it was God's word to me. Now, he didn't have to apologize. In the big scheme of things, it probably was not a big deal. I don't know if it would have made any difference if he'd stuck around in those six years or not in terms of how things had impacted me. But to me, what he said was God's response to me in God's timing seven years later and helped restore me to hope as I was reevaluating my life and reevaluating my call. And sure enough, when I was better, God sent me back to this church. He gave me a second chance, but this time, Along with this other brother who stood with me shoulder to shoulder, we began to rebuild the ministry, and we stayed on. I stayed on for another seven years, and we saw lots of fruit in ministry. How do we respond in times of trouble? Number one, in prayer. Not just any prayer, but in dialogical and conversational prayer with God. Number two, with patience and in vigilance, as if we were in a tower waiting for God's word to us. Number three, we wait. We wait on God's timing, the Lord's timing, not our own timing, not on what our mind and our rationality thinks, what makes sense to the world. We wait on God's timing. God's timing and God's ways are not our timing and our ways. His are higher. His is better. And we often have to wait to be faithful and to be patient and to wait. I want to look now at that last section of our text starting at verse 4, which is the actual vision that Yahweh gives to Habakkuk. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. His soul here is referring to Babylon. It's a contrast here that the, uh, the vision is making between the wicked in Babylon and the righteous in Israel. Not all in Israel were wicked. They were righteous in Israel as well. So here, finally, God is acknowledging Habakkuk's second complaint that Babylon is to be judged. Babylon's soul is puffed up. It is not upright. It is not righteous. In contrast, the righteous who live faithfully according to God's Torah, his law, they will live. The inference then is that the wicked will perish. Even though that's not written here in verse 4, Habakkuk spells it out, spells it out in verses 6 to 20. And I don't have time to read through all of it and cover all of it, but I just want to summarize it as a whole. This long section from verses 6 to 20, there are five woes that are spoken over Babylon. Now, woe is a cry of distress, or in this context, it's the context, it's the warning of judgment, warning of impending judgment on Babylon. Habakkuk speaks five of them over Babylon for its greed, for its drunkenness, for its violence, for its wickedness and injustice, and finally for its idolatry. Five woes. All of that, God sees. The wickedness of Babylon God sees, and he will judge. In a nutshell, God is answering Habakkuk's second complaint by saying, yes, I see the injustice. I see their unrighteousness. I see all of it, and the time is coming. In other words, God is saying that he is sovereign over all nations, not just Israel, not just Judah, but over the entire earth. He sees all injustices. Every instance of human behavior that is not lined up with his will, with his purposes, whether it be global issues or national issues like uh, racial injustice and the history of the residential schools in Canada, whether well, it has to do with our personal issues, our domestic issues in our own homes or what we experience in our relationships. All the injustice that is perpetrated by humanity, he sees it and he knows it and he will deal with it in his time. That is God's promise to us and that is God's word to us. Now, I don't know what it is that you're going through, what circumstances that you're hoping for and praying for in a deep way in your heart. I don't know how long it is that you've been in that watchtower, in that place, watching and waiting. But I do know that God's timing is perfect. And I know that God is faithful and just and compassionate. And he will not let you down. He promises. If you trust in him, if you wait on him and put your hope in him, he will not let you down. He sees. He knows, and he will act to restore what is right when it is right. 
So we take heart in this and let us all be encouraged. Amen.